All right. Intimacy with God, John chapter 17, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. And uh, as you're looking at that, I'm going to read it. Uh, John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. We, we may or may not get to verses uh, 21 through 26, but but we will we will definitely try. Okay. John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Um, this is Jesus this is one of the recognized prayers uh, uh, that he that he spoke to, and he spoke it in a way that uh, he uh, was uh, kind of delivering the message of what his purpose for coming to this world was and in, in that prayer is a prayer that he prays not only for himself but he prays for his disciples and he prays for the future believer the future believer and that's you and I he prays that in this prayer and it is a remarkable prayer it's something that you and I can learn to if we can learn to pray like that or maybe you do pray like that is that it's okay to pray for yourself. It's okay to pray for yourself. And it's okay to pray for the believers in our community here at Glorietta Baptist Church. And it is also okay to pray for those people that you will come in contact and God will give you, may give you the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. So it's okay to, to pray like that. And so in verse one, it says, Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son and that your son may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself and with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Again, this prayer is setting up eventually what Jesus was, was going to was going to happen to Jesus, okay? He was here praying with his disciples. A little bit later, he would go to the garden and he would, uh, he would pray there in the garden. And then after the prayer in the garden, he would be arrested and he would be tried and then on to, to, the, to the cross and then eventually to the grave and then being resurrected. That is the, the sequence of what is going to happen, but yet it had not happened when Jesus was praying this, okay? So <clears throat> two things that I think that uh, may help us to understand today is that uh, Jesus' prayer reveals that uh, we are a witness to the world, a witness to the world, and that in all that we do and say gives glory to God gives glory to God everything that is our ultimate purpose uh, that's why God created us was to give him the glory and so we see that all this in this prayer and it's that's what makes it so remarkable what what and how he prays for this and and as we study this you could you could go by individual verse by verse and, and you wouldn't be able to to teach all the components of what Jesus is, is trying to get across to us. So we'll, we'll try to do our best and just explain a little bit of what what how the lesson pertains to you and I today. So it is intimacy with God and is it working? Okay. He says there, Father, the hour has come. And in that, as just, I just recently described, is that is the sequence. We, we see the guarding there, the hour has come. He's talking to the disciples and the, 
the prayer that he prays is a, um, a prayer that uh, involves uh, the whole picture of what Christ is going to accomplish by going to the cross. And so, and then, and when I got a picture of, of Golgotha. On top of Golgotha is where the crosses were there, and that's where Jesus died on the cross. And you remember what he said, it is finished. It is finished. The work is completed. Now, it corresponds with what he says here. He says, I have finished the work that you have com given to me. I've completed it. Yet, it hadn't happened yet, but it was going to happen. And then the last picture says, there's a picture of the tomb where they believe that that was where Jesus uh, was buried. And when you go in, it's empty. Nothing there. He is not here. He is with the Father, okay? So, he says, glorify the Son. Father, glorify the Son. And the Son to glorify the Father there in verse 1. What does that, what is he trying to, to say to you and I today? Well, he's, he's describing glory. What is glory? And it's one of those big words that, you know, we as Christians have, will come to learn if you don't already know what glory is. But we will come to learn it. But here, I believe the writer is using it to, to describe like um, uh, a reputation or, or a type of uh, fame. And when, when Jesus goes to the cross, what do he he says, now, now glorify the Son to glorify the Father and the Father to glorify the Son. He was asking, he was saying to you and I, is what is this glory and what does glory mean to us and how can we translate that into how we, as, as believers in Jesus Christ, how do we respond, respond to glory? And then how did Jesus glorify the Father? And again, by going to the cross. Because the cross to you and I as man was a despicable thing. It was, a, it was a, an injustice to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The cross was, was beneath what you and I would say is an allowable uh, condemnation. It, that's, it was degrading. It was all those, but yet it was through the cross that that the glory of Christ comes through. Uh, it's it's like uh, the picture of, of you may have a mental picture of the the resurrection of Jesus Christ when he goes into the grave, and it's all dark and and just uh, there's no light in it. But then you know when when he he. He is raised from the dead the third day. It's like that little trickle of light. It slowly begins to glow and, and get brighter and brighter. And well, that's, that's what the picture here is, is that, that this glory that John is writing about, it is, it is about the reputation and, and what, what occurs after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And that's important to you and I because that's the basis of what we believe. It is the, the end result of why Christ came from heaven to earth and to die for your and I sins. To be buried, rise again, and ascend back up to the Father. And you see, this is, that's the basis of what you and I believe. Well... Another picture is that we know the sun. The sun has glory, does it not? Uh, when you look at the sun, the, it can be represented as a beautiful uh, image. But, you know, we don't never see the, the gases and the, the chemical reactions that happen with when the sun, when they interact together, we just see the, the flames or we see the, the overall picture of what is occurring on the sun. Well, it's the same thing with Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross, we know sometimes we, we don't see and recognize all the things that he did, but we see what occurred as a result of what he was doing on the earth. And that is that he was revealing God's glory. And again, you and I, the only reason that we were created, the only reason that we exist is to give God God, the glory. 
God receives all the glory. The cross was Jesus, it was his, and the glory that comes from that is that it drew men to himself. It drew men to himself, and that's the glory of it, is that how many times have we uh, experienced the death of an individual that, who is well known and had a reputation? And then, you know, as we gather there in the service, how many times do, is, do we finally see the true picture of that individual when, when it is expressed through their loved ones and expressed through the friends and we see all their actions that they did that, you know, that it never dawned unto on us that that had happened or occurred but it was after the death that we see these these actions and these these good deeds of that individual well that's that's the glory that that John is trying to get across to us is that is that reputation that that fame so to speak okay um peter Peter writes in chapter 2, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, the man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in the midst, in your midst, just as you sell, yourself knows. And, and then in verse 23, he says, This man delivered over by predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men, and you put him to death. Verse 24 says, said, but God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in power. And so we see that, that in the cross, we see that Jesus receives glory. And again, that glory is, is the reputation of what he is trying to reveal to you and I, the glory of God. And in that act, we see the glory of God. Eternal life is a relationship. Eternal life is a relationship. And when we look at that, Sometimes we think of eternal life as something that is going to come, something that is going to happen later on. But here John is, is referring to this eternal life, and he uses it in present tense. What that means is that right now, right now is our eternal life. What are we doing right now? Sometimes we think that when I die, I will go on to have eternal life. Well, the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ, the moment by faith you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, eternal life began. And so the question is posed, what are you doing with this eternal life? That is there in verses 2 and 3. He says, as, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. That he should give eternal life. And in verse 3, he kind of just kind of hits, it's the home run with it here, describing eternal life. He says, and this is eternal life. Meaning, right now, we have eternal life. And what are we doing with this eternal life? What are we doing? Because Jesus gave us the example of how to live, right? He gave us the example the moment that he began his ministry. It was nonstop action of doing what he was supposed to do. He was constantly and consistently doing what God had given him to do. So again, I ask the question, what are we doing with what God has given us? As it is related by Jesus' actions here in this prayer. What are we doing with it? What are you doing with it? And so 
here also, as he, he refers to eternal life, this eternal life is more than just, just, uh, being, just walking around being blessed. It's, it's more than just being a, having a, a secure account. It's more than, than just being, being saved from things that are, will, will harm us or eventually destroy us. It's more than that. It is a relationship. It is an intimate relationship. So when, when Jesus comes to the cross and he dies on the cross, he makes it God available to you and I. We have access to God through the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he brings us together into that intimate relationship. And so to know God, this is what Barclay wrote in one of his commentaries. He said, to know God is not just to have intellectual knowledge, to have head knowledge. It is an intimate and interactive relationship with God. An intimate interactive relationship with God. So what does that mean? First of all, to be intimate with someone, and the Bible uses this and references this in Genesis where, where uh, it said that Adam knew Eve. And then sometimes we look at that as a sexual reference, but there's more to God's word than just that that topical meaning, it means to know. And it, it, it describes that relationship of a man and a woman in a relationship of, in the relationship of marriage, to know one another. And when, we, when, when John is writing about this eternal life, he is depicting it as a in, intimate relationship to know God, to know God. That means you know what he, he wants us to do. Like, uh, like um, for me, for instance, I, I would like to claim that I know Carla. Okay? I don't know if she can hear me, but Carla's a very complex person. And she surprises me every day. In fact, you know, in, the difference as this is, is that, you know, I, I, I work from day to day. Carla works at month to month, and I know that. I know that about her. I know that there's things that she is very sensitive about. I know there's things that she is very, she has a very real interest about. I know that. And it's more than just, just to know, you know. Um, before our relationship began, I, I know I known about her. I, I knew about her, but I didn't know her. And you and I in our relationship with God is at one time we knew about God or we may not ever heard of God. But now because of Jesus Christ, we know God. We know God and we just don't know him up here. We know him in here. Okay. And intimacy begins with the recognition that, that Jesus was sent from God. Look at verse 3. It says, In this eternal life that they may know you, the, the only true God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. So recognition, the in, intimacy begins with recognition of who Jesus was and why he was sent. Why he was sent. And again, we, we know that. The ultimate purpose of you and I is to give God the glory, to give God the glory. So, knowledge is not possession of information. I know I've acquired a lot of information about Carla, but there's things that I know about Carla intimately. I know what makes her happy. I know what motivates her. Those are, those are what is important. Knowledge is not the possession of information, but rather it's application. Application. You can have knowledge about someone without actually knowing someone. And this is eternal life. Now, 
some of these suggestions real quickly. I know we're running out of time, but some some suggestions for developing an intimate uh, relationship with God may include uh, looking for opportunities. You can look for opportunities uh, for a deeper relationship with God. You can accept that your responsibility, your your relationship with God, it was going to be on the mountaintop sometimes. It's going to be in the valley sometimes. So you recognize that it's not always going to be up here. Sometimes it's going to be down here. But you have that understanding of knowing that no matter if you're up on the mountaintop or in the valley, God is still with you. You stay connected by with God and, and uh, just developing a more... A deeper relationship by studying his word. The more my, the, the more time that you spend in the word of God, the deeper that relationship is going to grow. And then you begin with an understanding that knowing that in his word, he has an answer for any questions that could be a challenge or, or problems that you encounter in your daily experiences. The answer is here. And the more we put this into us, the more that we have answers for the questions that we have in our daily lives. Pray, pray, make an effort, a conscious effort to talk with God daily. Make a conscious effort to pray and talk with God and listen to what God has to say to us. Now, Barriers to relationship. What are some barriers to relationship? We all know that, that you know, me and God would like to say that me and Carla's relationship is, is just 100% joy and happiness all the time, but it's not. And sometimes in the early uh, stages of our marriage, it was, it was a very trying time because we came from two different backgrounds. We came from two different uh, ways of, of living our lives. And so there are barriers to intimacy, and they are barriers that will cause a limitation to what, what God can do in your life. And one of them is selective perception. What is selective perception? Well, we see our view only. We don't try to see God's or see through God's eyes sometimes. And, and that can be in, in like preconceived notions. It could be in, in desires. And it could even be in fears. So we're selective in our perception of what God wants to do in our life. So sometimes that causes a barrier and that limits us to what we can actually do for God. It is um, maybe uh, we could lead to negativity in relationships. We don't see eye to eye on certain things, so it stalls the communication. Another one is emotional disconnects. It says that we, we, have, we don't have a sense of belonging. When, when you first came to Christ, and I know the ideal picture is that when you come to Christ, everything's going to be all right. And when you came to Christ and you joined the fellowship of the church, did you automatically feel connected? Did you feel automatically connected? And sometimes when we weigh that into what these emotional disconnects mean is that sometimes we, we stand off because we don't want to connect because maybe they don't look like me. Maybe they don't talk like me. Maybe they don't act like me. And so we stand off and we emotionally disconnect. And you know what, but God's greater picture is that once we come to know Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. There's no difference. We're all children of God. But yet emotional disconnects often cause us to be isolated. We're in a group of people here right now. How many of us feel like I'm here by myself? I'm all alone. But yet we're in a group. That's an emotional disconnect, and it can limit you to what God can do through your life. The last one is difference in attitude or difference in, a, uh, in meaning. We, we apply our meaning rather than what God's meaning 
is for our lives. We often hear the stories of individuals who come whose lives have been troubled and has, has constantly experienced difficulties. And when they come to God, they, 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 they hear the message and they believe that once they give their life to, to God, that all their poof, all their difficulties and all their problems are going to disappear. And they have a different meaning to what God is going to do in their life. And sometimes that it becomes a barrier in relationships, especially in relationships. If we have a difference in meaning about how we're going to raise our children, that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big thing. How are we going to work and manage the relationship in the marriage? If we have a different perspective on that, how's it going to work? And so in, in that relationship with God, there is a difference of meaning. God said he's, that his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. They're totally different from ours. And so when we come to God, we have these, these differences of meanings. But that comes with applying biblical study. That means spending time with God and listening to what God is wanting to show you. And that's how it develops into the same meaning. In the beginning, me and Carla had different meanings of marriage. And slowly but surely, we're, we're beginning to, to comply with that. And so, you know, some of the hard things that would just kind of, she'd go off to one room, I'd just go storming out of the house. But now we settle down because we've grown together. We come to learn each other, learn that, she don't think like I do, and I don't think like she does, but we're learning, learning to work together. And so the same way in the relationship with God is that, that God's meanings are different from ours. But once we align to that, things begin to change in our, in our lives. Okay? Glory comes through obedience. And we see that in the life of Christ. Verses 4 and 5, it says, I have glorified you on earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. What is the work that he's talking about here? The work that, is it, was it him doing miracles? Was it him healing people? Was, it, was that his work that he's talking about here? I think John is referring to this work of salvation. This work of salvation. I've completed the work that you've done. And he has yet to go to the cross, right? He's yet to go to the cross when he's praying this. So, so what is John, what is he trying to get across to us? And I think it's what, what Jesus is saying. And, he is, and it's because he's God. He's also man. Everything that he did in this, on this earthly ministry, he did as a man. And if, if you study the work of Jesus Christ, you'll notice that he always spent time with God. Jesus, I don't like to use the word never, but Jesus never did anything on his own. It was always through the Father. And so, so this this. What is he saying? I have completed. I have completed the work you have given me to do. At the cross, Jesus said, "It is finished. It's done. I, I've done what I've came here to do. I've come to reveal your glory to man. I've got. I've done what you've asked me to do. You commanded me to do. I've done it by giving my life on the cross, whereby, through my death, through my burial and resurrection." I will bring man to the Father. And there is the glory in that. And so glory comes through obedience. He says, I have finished the work, and Jesus was obedient to the Father at all times. Again, our prime example, I think this prayer is giving us an example of how we're to live our lives. How our lives copy or mirror the life of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, he was Jesus. He was God. He could do that. But he was also man. And he fully did everything that he did through the power of the Father. You and I have that. It's 
comes through that intimate relationship with God, knowing that what God is going to allow to happen will occur because we're, we're obedient to the Father. I often wondered about, like, uh, you think of uh, John and Peter there at the steps of the temple. And, and as they was walking up to the temple to pray, that man that was sitting there on the steps, uh, he was crippled and he was lame. And he asked them for, for money. What did John and Peter tell them? What did they say? Silver and gold have I not. But what I, and this is a paraphrase, so don't take me out of content here. But what I have, I'm going to give to you. So now rise in the name of Jesus. Folks, do you know that we have that same power? We have that same power. Jesus Christ said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. God says, I don't change. We have that same power. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Jesus Christ. It's the same God the Father. Nothing has changed. We have that same ability. It's just, is our relationship with God that intimate? Is it? And so glory comes through obedience. And First John, and John writes later on in First John, he says, now that we know this, that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And we have learned that in our Wednesday night Bible studies. We have learned that. But whoever, whoever keeps his word, Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. It's developed in him. It's, it's growing in him. It's maturing in him. By this, we know that we are in him, in him. And he who says he abides in him ought to himself also walk just as he walked. It's incredible, isn't it not? We have the example of how we're to live our lives. And Jesus is praying this for us, that we would be like him. So why do we not? Why don't we? Well, we have to look back at those barriers. We have to look at and, and examine those barriers. What, what barriers are limiting from fully having an intimate relationship with God? And lastly, uh, Christ is vital. Christ in you is vital. And I draw your attentions to in you. Christ is vital in you. Jesus said in the earlier chapter there, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Do you think maybe that some of the things that we're doing here at Gloria as a Baptist church, are we doing without Christ? Are we working on what we can do because of our meaning of what is supposed to happen here? Are we limiting what God can do because maybe our perception is different from each individual in here in the church? Christ is vital in you of his prayer and he spoke of a unique relationship he had with the father the father 